Good morning. And welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Lori Baining, Associate Pastor for Congregational Care, and it is good to see all of you here today on a cloudy morning, it looks like. If you are a first-time visitor here at Westminster, and would, um, we have a little gift for you, if you'd like to raise your hand and let us know where you are, um, that would be great. And if not, if you're not comfortable with that, if you'd like to meet Andrea out back, um, in the narthex after the service. She has a little gift for you and uh, would like to say welcome to you as well. Thank you, Andrea. It is a um, beautiful day to worship God. And as we do so, I invite you to find um, the little red friendship pad, the who's who in the pew. And uh, please let us know that you are here, sign it, and then pass it down the row and then pass it back again so that, uh, that you can tell who's seated um, on the same pew with you. It's a way for us to get to know each other and also um, for us to know when you're not here as well so that we can uh, give a call and just say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, and to follow up with uh, congregational care is what we call it. It is uh, the second Sunday in the new year and you'll look in the bulletin and see that there are um, activities going on, new classes as well on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and um, other opportunities for service as well as for fellowship. We do have the memorial candle um, burning this morning. Wilma Pointer uh, was passed away the 2nd of January. She is a longtime member. She turned 100 this year and celebrated it by uh, riding in the sidecar of Don Hildebrand's motorcycle um, up at the manor. <laughs> she was quite the lady. And um, so we remember her at this time and also Jerry Lossman. Uh, Jerry has not been at services with us for probably, I guess the last time would have been over a year or so ago. Uh, he passed away on early Friday evening up at the manor. And so we remember Adonis, his wife, and their family as well. As you know, I think what Barnabas mentioned last week, we're starting a new series, a series called What is the Gospel or The Gospel Is, dot, 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 something like that. And he's, we started last week with his sermon on the gospel is the word made flesh. Hey, would you guys like to sit down back there? You're looking, would you like to come sit down? Would you come sit down? Come on. <laughs> it's not bothering me. And uh, the word, the gospel is the word made flesh. And then now this week we're looking at the gospel is bigger than you think. I want I wanted just to get us thinking about this topic today. You know, I am so grateful for my college education. My parents were not, did not have a lot of formal education. My dad went through eighth grade. My mom got her GED, her high school equivalency diploma, the same year I graduated from high school. She went to night school classes and did it. And she was a voracious reader, but they wanted to make sure that their kids got college educated if they wanted to do so. And so I followed in my two older sister's footsteps and went to a Christian liberal arts college in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, you know, I had grown up in a Christian home, gone to church probably twice most of the time on Sundays, actually. Went to Sunday school, went to catechism classes, those classes that you take when you're getting ready to join the church, you know. And so I knew the faith. I knew kind of the do's and don'ts of Christianity and all that. And, uh, you know, go to church on Sunday, don't swear, be nice, you know, those kind of things. But it was really, it was at Calvin was where I learned more of a Christian worldview. That suddenly I looked through everything with a different set of lenses. That from um, my career, what classes I took, what I would want to be when I grew up, how God would want to work through me. Um, from my dating relationships, what I did in those dating relationships the kind of person that I would marry and what that meant. It, Calvin just gave me a different perspective on the world. The, the gospel became bigger than what I originally knew. One of the things, I looked on our, the Calvin website recently because our daughter Annalise is now at Calvin. I am so thankful for that. Never would I have ever guessed one of my kids would be able to be there because I went when it was 4000 a year, you know. Whew, um, not anymore. But it says, one of the things it says 
on their mission statement, and I'm not getting any money for this, okay? I want you to know the college is not writing me a check, okay? Calvin College is a comprehensive liberal arts college in the reformed tradition of historic Christianity. Through our learning, we seek to be agents of renewal in the academy, church, and society. We pledge fidelity to Jesus Christ, offering our hearts and our lives to do God's work in God's world. Wow. This isn't just Sunday mornings, is it? <laughs> There's an essay on the website also entitled Our Calling, written by Cornelius Plantinga, Jr. He writes, we are now fallen creatures in a fallen world. The Christian gospel tells us that all hell has broken loose in this sorry world, but also that in Christ, all heaven has come to do battle. I like that. Christ the warrior has come to defeat worldly power and to equip a people informed, devout, educated, pious, determined people to follow him in writing what is wrong in transforming what's corrupted and doing the things that make for peace. Plantiga writes, as C.S. Lewis once, says, once said, we are trying to retake territory that has been captured by the enemy. We are trying to recapture society, culture, and all creation for Jesus Christ. My friends, the gospel is bigger than you think. And so as we prepare for worship, as you read the prayers uh, in, the, in the service, as you uh, participate in the singing of hymns, as you hear the word read and preached, keep this thought in mind. The gospel is bigger than you think. Let us worship God. Since I talked so much about Kelvin, I want you to know I'm using my Whitworth mug up here today. <laughs> I feel I have to give each place current due. I have another daughter who's at Whitworth this year, for those of you who aren't familiar with that. so <laughs> If you want to know what the gospel is all about, I encourage you to read the fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. And if you want to know the heart of John's gospel, John 3, 16 and following says it all. So I invite you to turn with me to John 3, page 1650 in your pew Bibles. We'll just read verse 16 and 17 for now. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, can you say it with me? That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Everlasting life. You learn the King James, yes. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's very cool. Anybody knows verse 18? Yeah, okay. And then we read from one of the letters from the Apostle Paul, one that he wrote to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, 
so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was going to see how many of you had the John 3.16 memorized, but you already showed me. That's amazing. And John 3.17 as well. Beautiful. This is indeed the heart of John's message. This is the heart of the gospel. God's ultimate purpose is not condemnation. Rather, it is salvation for the entire world. Now, I'm not preaching a universalistic kind of a gospel here, but God's Jesus Christ died and Jesus Christ lives, not just for the Jews, not just for the Gentiles, not just for Anglo-European Americans, not just for Americans even, and not even just for the elect. Now, that's a big Reformed thought. Jesus Christ actually came for the whole world. God took the initiative. Now, reading the Old Testament, you read the story of a God who keeps pursuing, don't you? Even as God's people continued to wander away from God, God continued to go after them to draw them back into a right relationship with him. God worked through the patriarchs, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through Elijah, Moses, and other people, the other leaders of the people, through prophet after prophet, until when the time was right, God himself came in the form of a human being, a baby even. Emmanuel. God with us. And as the angel told Joseph, the carpenter, many, many years ago, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. My friends, the heart of the Christian gospel is this. Through Jesus Christ, God offers the gift of salvation to all people. All that people have to do is to accept that gift. Now there's the rub. The work has already been done. The onus is now on us. Are we going to choose to believe or not? To accept the gift or not? When we believe what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, we accept this free gift and God promises us eternal life, life that has value, meaning, purpose, because we know that we are loved and accepted by God for all eternity. Belief is accepting something, not doing something. And yet, that's not all there is to it. Because, friends, we are saved for a purpose. Once we believe and accept the work that Jesus Christ has done to reconcile us to God, to make us right with God, because in our sinfulness we could never do it on our own, then God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, whoa, uses us to be God's agents of redemption and reconciliation in the world. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5 is all about. That through Jesus' death on the cross, we, my friends, are a new creation, and we have a message of reconciliation for the world, a ministry of reconciliation to the world. We are Christ's ambassadors, representatives of Jesus Christ in our world, to our neighbor next door, to the clerk in the checkout line, to the customer service on the other end of the phone, even if they are in India, my friends. 
we still are to be a witness for Jesus Christ to that person. And as I like to say, every day we are a witness for Jesus, either positively or negatively. We are also representatives of Jesus Christ to our spouse, to our brother or our sister who might not be a believer, to our children or to our parents. I find that pretty amazing. I mean, is there any other world religion whose God takes the initiative, reaching out in love, in order to redeem humanity and all creation from sin and evil? If there is, let me know. Is there any other world religion whose God seeks to draw humanity, each individual person, into a loving, personal relationship with that God? Is there any other world religion whose God calls people to be ministers of reconciliation and equips people, to quote Planting again, again, to follow God in righting what's wrong, in transforming what's corrupted, in doing the things that make for peace? The gospel is bigger than you think. So accepting the gospel, believing in Jesus Christ, to say the negative, it's not simply a divine get-out-of-jail-free card, you know. I'm concerned because sometimes there are some Christians, and maybe some of us are sitting here this morning, that simply think that believing in Jesus Christ is knowing, phew, okay, I'm saved. At least I know I'm going to heaven when I die. And that's it. That we think that it's about coming to church on Sunday morning, being nice, not swearing. That's part of it, my friends. Yet the gospel is bigger than you think. Remember when I read the words from the Calvin College website, we seek to be agents of renewal in the academy, church, and society. How many of you are teachers or were a teacher at one time? Yes. I encourage you to pray every morning, God, how can I be an agent of renewal in the academy today? It says at the, on the Calvin website again, offering our hearts and lives to do God's work in God's world. We seek to follow Christ in righting what's wrong, in transforming what's corrupted, in doing the things that make for peace. And the C.S. Lewis quote, We are trying to retake territory that has been captured by the enemy. We are trying to recapture society, culture, and all creation for Jesus Christ. This is not some right-wing political agenda here. This is simply each one of us individually being ministers of reconciliation, being Christ's ambassadors in the world. So how do we go about doing this? Some of you already are. Many of you already are. One way that we can do it is to get involved here in our church and also in our community. If you have some time, and all of us probably would have one hour a week, volunteer as a tutor at one of our schools. Especially the high school and the middle schools. Boy, they need some positive role models there. You can be a reading buddy at an elementary school. Talk to Judith um, Harris or Mike Van Winkle about serving in the Sunday school here or working with a youth group here at Westminster. Become a CASA volunteer or give Hearts with a Mission a call. Get to know the folks who live near you by becoming a neighborhood coordinator with the Medford Food Project. And in doing so, you help area food pantries, including our own, help people in need. Run for public office. Perhaps as a school board member, 
city council member, mayor, or district attorney. Those, we have those members of our church who are doing that already. I am asking each of you to simply prayerfully consider how God might want to use you to bring the redeeming love of Jesus Christ to our community. We can recapture all of creation for Jesus Christ by being wise stewards of God's creation, right? Environmental concerns are not for tree huggers only. They are also for us as Christians. Redeeming God's creation means that maybe we walk or ride a bike whenever we can, or maybe we carpool to church as much as possible. Please, it really will help the congestion in the parking lot, too. It means we use canvas bags when we go to the grocery store instead of plastic, and we really try hard to remember to bring them in from the car with us, you know? We recycle as much as we can. Now, if you ask my husband, he will tell you that I'm a bit obsessive-compulsive when it comes to recycling. Even when we're on vacation, I want to recycle, you know. And he puts his foot down and we have to get on the airplane, though, and I'm bringing my recycling home. So can't do that. But uh, did you know, though, my friends, that beginning February 1, Rogue Disposal will be accepting clean plastic containers like yogurt, butter, and sour cream in their red recycling bins. Yoo-hoo! I'm so glad. I am so glad, Sue. We must be thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> she and I have a passion about this. Recycling, it's a way, it's not just a political thing to do because it's cool, because it's trendy, because we live in Oregon. It's because we are Christians. It's because we are God's agents of renewal in creation. And we are concerned about God's world and we seek to be wise, wise stewards of God's world as well. Perhaps we can follow Christ in righting what's wrong and transforming what's corrupted and doing the things that make for peace by teaching our children and our grandchildren, our nieces and our nephews, a Christian view of human sexuality. Wow. Whether you are watching TV at night, whether you are standing in the checkout line and see the magazines next to you, if you see the movie reviews and what movies are about nowadays, my friends, oh, we have gotten that distorted big time. Perhaps we can teach and we can model that sex is a beautiful gift to be shared and enjoyed in the context of a loving marriage between one man and one woman. That is countercultural. And yet, my friends, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, may we lovingly seek to be a positive witness in the world regarding human sexuality as well. Maybe, my friends, we can each be Christ's ambassador simply by looking at every person we meet the way God looks at that person. A fallen, sinful human being impacted by a fallen, sinful world. And yet, definitely redeemable by Jesus Christ. Maybe we need to look at ourselves that way as well. In his Advent devotional, Let Every Heart, Thomas Pless writes, what can we do to make a real difference in our world? First, we can determine to let Jesus rule in our own hearts completely. Then we can earnestly pray and act so that others will come to know him as Savior and Lord. God wants to change the evil that is rampant in the world around us. 
Our hesitancy to let God begin in us is the only thing that limits him. My friends, the gospel is bigger than you think. Let us pray. And as we do so, let us begin with a time of silence. Our hearts open and waiting to hear what God might want to say to each of us personally. Let us pray. Holy God and Redeemer of the universe, Strengthen and empower us, I pray, to live the life you have called us to as your redeemed children. Make our lives so attractive to the people around us that they will hunger for you, that they will want to know the God that we worship, that they will want to know the Jesus who lives in us. God, may others see the good works that we do and give glory to you, God, our Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.